So, are we ready to go for our demo at 10 after the hour? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're ready to go. Who's the last time to go? Everybody, this is Doug Rowe and Ducky. Oh, not Doug, Doug Rowe. Doug Rowe's in Arizona. <laughs> Doug Miller. The other Doug, Doug Miller. All right. All right. All right. Uh, Gonna mute everybody. You, uh, Doug, you may have to come back to us in one moment. We just okay. muted everybody and. Okay. Uh, the there way we go. We, the way we work this, members, is uh, we mute everybody doing a demonstration so that we do not get background sounds. Uh, it's not that we don't want to limit your questions or comments. Uh, but we'd prefer if you'd let the demonstrator do his demonstration without saying, yeah, but you know what? Um, hold on to that for a little bit. First, I want to see, first, I want to see Doug do this piece of wood. I really do. It's a beautiful piece. I think he's going to give us a fantastic job. Go for it, Doug. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, looking through YouTube and Facebook like I normally do, and I was seeing I think there's a couple of clubs across the country that are doing round bottom bowl challenges for the club. And I was seeing a lot of them, and, and they just kind of intrigued me. I've seen them from time to time, and I just never thought about it. Um, I, you know, mo We usually want our bowls to sit real nice and steady. So we put a, some kind of a concave bottom on it uh, in some way so that it sits steady. Uh, but these round bottom bowls are just kind of neat because they will – They'll sit there and wiggle, and they'll spin. They'll do all kind of fun stuff. Um, so I've done several. That's That was probably the first one I did. That's just, I pulled up some cherry that's been laying around here. It was a, a split off of a, a bowl that I did. And so I got a couple of blanks, did that one, and I did this one. This one's even rounder, um, wobbles even better. Um, and I did this one. Yesterday, I believe it was, uh, just trying to get ready for tonight. Um, again, um, just nice and round. You can see there the bottom is, get my hand turned around. Uh, the bottom's just nice and smooth. It's round. Um, you know, very simple. Then I did one more uh, today, a uh, piece of oak. Uh, Eddie was talking about dunnage a while ago. This is some oak dunnage that I picked up a couple years ago. Um, recycling place up the road here cost me nothing. I, I brought home just piles of it. I'm, I finally cut it up into smaller blanks so I can use it. But there again, it wiggles and wobbles. That has no finish on it yet. Um, I get so it's no glare on it. So you can see that it actually is a round bottom. Um, anyway, that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, I, I called Eddie the other day. I said, which would you rather me do? And he said, let's do the round bottom bowl. And then Dane texted me yesterday and said, let's do round bottom and uh, abrasive paste. And so if I have time, that's what we'll do. Uh, I showed you for the last couple of weeks, uh, black limba. Uh, I've got these five blanks. They're all four by two, four inches diameter, uh, two inches thick. And so uh, I'm, my plan is to do five different styles of turning. I've done a box. I've done a bowl with a rim on it. This one will be a round bottom bowl, more of a calabash style. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, let me just kind of jump right in. All the normal uh, safety stuff, you know, no rings. I've taken my ring off. It's in my pocket. Uh, I do have my, there it is, got my face shield. I'll be pulling it down as I start. Um, tools are sharp. I've sharpened three, four bowl gouges. I don't think I'll need, but this is one. Uh, and I'll, I'll use this bowl gouge, and I will use a, the Easy Wood Tools uh, Easy Finisher uh, just to clean up the bottom on the inside uh, where the, the gouge has a hard time getting around that inside curve. And so uh, let's get to it. First thing I'm going to do is just kind of square up the side and, and I'll start the uh, uh, rounding process before I put it, uh, even as I put a tenon on here. So let's get going. Face shield down. Run the speed up to 1200.
Okay. Gotta get these bowls off of here. There we go. Now I was doing a little pull cut. Now I'm gonna go to a push cut. One more time. All right. So we're round that way. It's nice and smooth. Can y'all hear me now? Okay. Dana, are you hearing me? You we're doing good with you. Okay. Just making sure because I got the face shield down, but I do have this mic underneath the face shield and it sounds hollow to me. But anyway, now let's good. work on the bottom. One pass just to square it up. I did lie to you just a little bit. I'm going to use my skew just to get a ever so slight dovetail on that tenon. Make sure I'm good and square. That's all it is. I'm just going to clean up the bottom of the tenon just a hair just to make sure I don't have anything to give me trouble down the road. That's not much of a tenon. Um, it's pretty small. But on these little pieces, I found that I just don't need a whole lot of tenon to, uh, to hold it and be secure. Oh, I didn't tell you, I've got this on a wormwood or a worm screw. There we go. Thought twice a while ago I needed to stop and tell you that, but I didn't. Just a simple hole drilled in the center, put on the worm screw, and it works beautifully. Seems to be a whole lot of discussion out there right now about the chuck. Um, people got to have this chuck, you got to have that chuck. This is one of the original Nova Chucks, the two bars. There's the one that I'm not using, the old crooked thing that hooks on the main body. And this one does the uh, other one, other uh, the adjusting side. But I just use my spindle lock and that works great. That lets me do it one handed. I just have to remember to unlock my spindle. Kind of important. Just that so I get my angle. I do have my headstock turned. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? Um, this just gives it so I don't have to reach out across the bed of the of the lathe. Again, we're just going to make one pass across to get it nice and square. Oh, and you know what? I forgot. I did not. I did not uh, start my rounding on that other side. Which is okay. I can fix that. That also gives me an opportunity to show that worm screw. Uh, so many people do it. Incorrectly, I see people get it straight or started 
and then they push it in all the way. That, they push it in that little bit. Pull it out when you get it close. Give it a little shake back and forth side to side. Make sure it's set in there good. And if it's pulled out, so it's like hitting the back side of your jaws, it won't come loose later on you. There we go. All right. Now we can Up my lathe, move my tool rest up a little closer. All right, I'm going to readjust my tool rest again. Come back to my back side here. You won't be able to see much of this, but you'll see the results. Um, yeah, you'll see the results back here on that side. Again, we, we've talked in the past about working with the grain. So that's why I want to start back here toward the nut so that as I'm coming out, I'm, I'm Still working with the grain. using a shear scrape to get off some of the stuff that we typically will sand off, but if I don't have to sand it, I'm not going to. A little lump right here between the two halves, uh, coming up from the bottom and going down from the top. and Just want to straighten that up before I turn it around. a little lump right there and feel it more than I can see it. Okay. Like I said, it takes longer to, to do the sanding and finishing than it does to turn them. Whether it was cherry or whether it was oak, they've been the same. Um, and this black limb is no different. Turns quite quickly, on, especially at this size. Four by two is just not a whole lot of wood. So it makes for not only fun, fast projects, but it also, uh, it's, it's inexpensive. These, these blanks, I got these five black limb of blanks and they're, it's, this is an African hardwood. They were five, they came to $5 a piece. So that's, you know, that's pretty cheap for an exotic. Okay. Check, we're all clear. I'm going to work, I'm going to start in the center, but I'm going to work back to the rim
going to turn these sides fairly thin. I'm not going to do them caved in, but I'm going to go pretty thin. Just so you know, Cade's watching. Okay. <laughs> Eight, I'm not going down to 116. I, I don't go Cade 10 either, Doug. It's all right. Oh, either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> or as we saw tonight, Matt Harbor thin. Yeah, I'm cool with having a level of thinness named after me. <laughs> oh, we didn't name him. We didn't name a funnel after you. <laughs> I got a T-shirt for that. Oh, okay. How good his slices are coming off there? Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, impact on a piece. He's slicing it very nicely. Using my digital calipers to see where I'm at. Metric or standard? Because of that, because that side is it's thicker here than it is at the rim, I'm going to come from the center out to that transition area, get some of this meat out of the bottom. You can see there that's you know i'm getting pretty good shavings even though i'm going technically i'm going backwards <laughs> yeah we're in good shape I really like using a pull cut on the thinner pieces. You can take really light cuts, clean up your edge that way. All right, I think I'm to the place of using that carbide. Yep. Somebody asked me, uh, they sent me a message after one seeing one of my texts or one of my videos where I use this tool. They said, "What easy wood tool is that?" They didn't recognize it. They didn't. They'd never seen one with a red handle, but that is an easy wood handle. There it is. This is one of the originals. Uh, the the guy who developed them had he was still looking at putting a contract with uh, Craft Supply when I got this one. So uh, this has been around a while. But I do have a nice fresh cutter on it. I have to comment here. Watch what he's doing with it, folks. That is being used sort of like a very, very good scraper. Now pay attention to how the bar is being presented. I created a term for this, Doug. It's called bias cut. Yeah. For those who have asked in chat tonight, am I still selling cutters? Um, I'm going out of business. 
um, what I have, that'll be it. It's becoming a conflict in my life, so I I use them just like Doug is using his. I guess that means I'm going to have to order a couple more bars from you then. Yeah, and, and consider this, everything's at one half price. I thought that's what I heard you say last week. Yeah, no snow. I, I missed that part. Not not fibbing about it. Not it's not a hype. Been told medically it's got to happen, or mentally it's got to happen. So I like the way that's sliced. Look at that. Yeah, it's nice. I'm just feeling to make sure I'm close to even. I've still got a fair amount of meat down in the bottom of this bowl. And if you guys that don't use these things, if you start using them, don't be tempted to do like you do with your bowl gouge and, and swipe it, get all the dust off the very tip. You'll slice your hand wide open and not even know it. I've done that on my bowl gouge. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. My first one, my first of these carbides was the, the uh, CI-1 the semi round one and uh, first time I used it I used it for about 20 minutes and was wiping the dust off and lo and behold there was red stuff on my wood and I said what in the world and I looked at my hand I had about 15 or 20 cuts didn't even know it this is why the gods gave us air compressors you guys <laughs> do what what'd you say I said, this is why the gods gave us air compressors to blow that stuff off with. There you go. But at the same time, he gave us lungs we don't want to breathe it into, so protect yourselves. Yeah. I do have, uh, I don't know if you can hear it or not. I've got my air cleaner on. Don't have the vacuum on. It's just, I can't hear myself when that thing's on. But I do have the air cleaner on. It's about, well, it's exactly five feet in front of me. So uh, it's cleaning the, the fine dust that floats around so bad. All right. Trying to see where we are on time. What is it, about 8.30 or 7.30 Central? Yeah. You have plenty yeah, of time, Doug. Right. You have plenty of time. All right. I'm going to make one more pass across that bottom. It's got some waves across there. Got to look at it this way. We either get a demonstration or a bunch of lies. Let's go for the demonstration. Oh, that's better. Okay, since we got this kind of time, I'm not going to do a super thorough sanding. I can come back and do that later, but I am going to do a cursory sanding just so I can get to the abrasive paste. If you need more time, it's only 5.30 in Pacific time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got uh, four more hours, right? Don't ask Donald what time it is. Don't ask Donald. No, it's early in the morning there. Doug, uh, you got plenty of time. You don't have to worry about being rushed. Hey, that took. Hey, what did that take? That took probably twenty minutes or so to turn. Um, it's going to take at least 30 minutes to sand and then another 10 or so to, to do the abrasive paste if I do a thorough job on the sanding. But what I'll do is, is kind of cursory, uh, do enough so you can see what we're talking about, and then I'll come back later and re-sand it. In fact, I'll probably turn it some more. That's still a little thick on it on that side for my taste.
That's something else we probably don't mention nearly enough. The thickness of your walls in a turning, for the most part, that's personal preference. Um, some people, you'll have some customers out there who really like a thin, thin wall. They want it paper thin. And that's great, especially for those guys who like to turn that thin. There are other customers out there who won't look at a thin piece. They want something that's got three-eighths or a half-inch thick. I see one that thick, and I think, oh, my goodness, somebody forgot to do the rest of the turning. Um, but that's what they like to do, and that's fine. I don't want them paper thin anymore. That's what I started out doing 20 years ago. But if I were to cut this in half, that'd take it down to about a 16th. I don't need it quite that thin. I just want a little bit more off of it, not a whole lot. I do need to bring the tool rest back up here. I, I forgot to do my rim. Right, wood, turner, do wood, turners love seeing, wood turners love seeing things that are really thin, and, and it's yeah. fun to do. But the general populace is afraid to touch things that are too thin. They think it's too delicate. So Especially you know, women. Yeah. If it's for sale, if you want to sell it, make it a little thicker. People will be much happier, even if they just use it for decoration. Yeah. I just put a little chamfer going into the bowl there, and that will give the illusion of it being a little thinner. Um, it's one way I satisfy my own mind a little bit. All right. Now. All right. There's a little bit of little fine tear out there, so I'm going to reverse it. Oh, that feels better already. All right. That was 60 grit. Just to kind of straighten up any of my mistakes and errors and whatnot. I'll come back with 100 grit. I'm getting ready to change my sanding routine a little bit. Um, 60 grit is awfully coarse awfully aggressive. I'm going to change my routine or my protocol. 80 grit was, is going to be my bottom. And then I'll go 120, 180, 240, 320. Uh, partly because that works out better mathematically. Russ Fairfield was mentioned earlier, and he was the one that always told me everything should step up by half of what you do. So like 80, half of 80 is 40. 40 and 80 is 120. So I'll go 80 to 120. Now half of 120 is 60. So 120 and 60 is 180. So that'll be my third grit. So uh, then I'll work my way on up. Uh, after after 180, you really, that, that doesn't hold water anymore. All right, let's reverse this again. Come back to forward. By switching direction, what we do is we get those hairs that are pushed down in one direction. We're going to lift them back up and cut them back off by going the other direction. So I don't always switch on every grit. Sometimes I'll switch every other grit. Sometimes I'll do one or do two grits in one direction, next two in the other direction, and then come back to forward in my final 320. How fast are you going there, Doug? I'm sorry. How fast what was your question? RPMs there? 500. And, and, and let me say this. Most of you understand it, I think. Um, but I think it, it bears good for us to say it once in a while. When we look at our RPM meters, if we have one, and it says 500 on there, we have to understand that's relative. 
those things are not very accurate <laughs> as a rule. Um, this lathe is a belt change lathe. And then I, I have added the uh, variable speed controller and motor. And it doesn't matter at this RPMs right now, the motor, I've got six different belt positions and it'll still say 500 on there, no matter what belt I put it on. So that 500 is relative. <laughs> But Dean, I think um, in answering your question, I think what I've done is I have uh, have uh, worked with it enough where I think I'm pretty close to the actual speed at this point. Uh, it may be off 10 or 15 RPMs. That's all. But the, the number doesn't matter if you brought the machine, the machine speed down to where the paper can cut instead of burnish. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think you've seen a lot of dust coming off at every with every grit so far. If you don't see that, folks, you're burnishing. Look at look at yeah. the cloud. Yeah, as I'm turning right out here, you you should be able to see a cloud of dust periodically. Anyway, and if I had the vacuum on, this is my vacuum, and and you know it would be sucking it right up. Yeah, we can we can see it, Doug. Or I can at least. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm I've got I'm shooting this on my iPhone and I've got my iPad just behind it so I can see what's going on, uh, and I can see it on on my iPad. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, With it going reverse, you can really see it. Yes, you can. <laughs> What grit you on now? I am up to 150. And really, you know, there's no reason to rush this this process. I hate the sand. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you I hate it. But I've also found out that the better job I do at sanding, the better my finish is. And uh, you know, I, as much as I hate sanding. I love a good finish. Phew. Well, there goes all my sandpaper. Get that smock dirty. Please don't get that smock dirty. <laughs> this one, I've, I've told my wife I need a new one so bad. I wash, I mean, this is freshly washed. <laughs> it's just from so much dust and glue and finish yep. and everything else being on it. That, that looks uh, just like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many of them do. Um, yeah, it doesn't take long. No. Some of you guys have been in some of the uh, demos and, and chats that I've been in with the guys from England. Wayne Clasper has one, a smock that that thing must be 20 years old. Pockets hanging off of it. It's discolored, but he won't. He will not put it away. He's got a brand new one. Um, Pretty amazing. I have one that's gorgeous with a lot of embroidery and all, but it shrunk when I washed it. <laughs> all right, I've got to step over here where I blew my sandpaper off. Got to pick up my 240 and 320. Ah. All right. If these had been used, I would have left them laying and picked up going in my box and gotten some fresh, but these are all brand new. Okay, we're up to 240 now. And my I'm looking at it even as it's spinning, and I can see my my sanding lines getting finer and finer. And that's the whole point. I'll never forget the demo I went to. I went primarily, well, the only reason I went that night was because Russ Fairfield was the demonstrator. I knew he would turn something, 
but I knew even more importantly than that, he would be showing his sanding technique. He turned a plate, about an eight or nine inch plate, no finish whatsoever, not even sanding sealer, just sanding it. He finished with a horsehair brush, sent it around, and you could not find a scratch anywhere. <laughs> he sanded, uh, oh, he went through his grits. He ended up with, uh, he did 800 grit sandpaper, and then he did a piece of brown paper bag. And then he did a horsehair brush. His claim was that brown paper bag is equal to 1,000 grit. Didn't somebody Boy, say that like last week? Didn't somebody say that last grit. last week in the meeting? Yeah. Well, always liking the brown bag to 800 grit. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've heard most people say, but Russ would always say 1,000 grit. Um, and that's where he would finish. Well, he, he finished sanding at that point. But then he used a horsehair brush, like a like a, it looked like a shoe brush. Yeah, the and that grit, thing shine. It would shine like it had lacquer on it. Toothbrush works great too in place of. What's well, that? My my goal with my cuts is to not have to is is to start sanding no no lower than than two twenty. So sometimes I can get there. The, the only the only issue you have with that is that you know if there's anything in that wood you're not getting it out you're leaving it if you have a, a burnish mark you know you, 220 is not going to typically take out a burnish mark right but if you've got but a good what, clean tool cut that my point is, is if you got a good clean tool cut you, then you don't have to do it you know what i'm saying i got you yeah 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 yeah, no, you're right. I'm, I'm not arguing at all. <laughs> um, it's just I, my tool cuts are not that great yet. I've only been doing this 20 years. I can't, I can't quite get there. It looked pretty clean to me, Doug. I don't know. <laughs> I figure if you well, got to start again, sanding with, if you got to start sanding with a brick, you probably need to work on your cutting. <laughs> All right. Well, let it lay this time. Okay. You don't need that grit. Well, I was done. I was done. That uh, just to feel it. I'm sorry, you guys can't feel it. That feels good. <laughs> but we've blown it. And just for the sake of argument, I'm going to take some denatured alcohol and give it a little wipe just to clean it. Oh, uh, there's my there's my version of the paper towel holder. Let's see, you can't can't see it, can you? There it oh, is. Yeah. Is that one of those <laughs> painted? Is it a plain coat hanger or a painted one? Oh, it's uh, just a plain wire one. All right. And I took my roll of half sheets over to the bandsaw and I cut them in half on the bandsaw. So these are quarter sheets that I'm pulling off. And I cut them, I pull them off, pull off several, cut them, fold them over and cut them in half. Now, then I'll take that and I'll fold it several times. Well, let's see, let's just fold that one a couple of times. Get some alcohol on here. I'll wipe that dust, what little bits left. Wipe it out of there. You see the brown? Yes. That's that's the residue dust that was in that wood even after I blew it. I started watching some of those guys in England and they religiously wiped it with alcohol. I finally said, why in the world are you wasting, of course they're calling it meths, methylated spirits. Same idea though. Anyhow, they, uh, Getting the dust out, getting the dust out. I'm thinking, why don't you blow it out first? That'll save you a little bit. That doesn't take long at all to dry and watch it. While it's drying, I'm picking up my my uh, sanding sealer. 
Billy, this is our stuff, man. Deft lacquer sanding sealer. Heard some guy named Captain Eddie talk about it on the internet one day. It's a great sanding sealer. Took, took me a month of Sundays to find any. Guess where I found it? Ace Hardware Store. I, I said that before. That's And if yep. they don't have it, they'll get it for you. Yes, sir. They have to get, you know, they have to get a case. They can't get a can. But they don't, they have never balked at it at all. They, if I say I want a can, they'll order it. They'll tell me it's coming in. I have to pay for it ahead of time, but I don't care. I want it anyway. If you really want it, yeah. you ask the store owner. Don't ask a salesman. Ask the store owner. They don't like passing up sales. All right, right. No, they'll go, they'll get it. My guys have not hesitated yet. Anytime I've asked them to order something, whether it's deaf mineral spirits or a deaf lacquer center, lacquer sanding sealer or the lacquer, either one, um, a uh, tap or a die drill bit, they take me straight over to the counter. We order it up. I have to pay for it ahead of time. But like I said, I'm wanted anyway. If I, if I didn't want it, I wouldn't be ordering it. So. My, well, order not that four, my corner ace ordered me a 14 inch draw knife that I wanted. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> can't get that at the big box stores, folks. You can't get that. No. The big box stores. No. They don't even know what you're talking about. Hardwood. This is a, my abrasive paste. This jar is just about gone. I've got another one sitting over here, though. So I've got, I'm okay. The whole Which idea brand? here is to, I'm sorry? Which brand name? This is Axe. All right. There are a yeah, couple so explain of. Your uh, process. Explain your process here, Doug. Yeah. There are a couple of these guys who, here in the United States, that make abrasive paste. Um, Tom Ackerley is just one of them. Uh, he's in Pennsylvania. Sells the abrasive paste and the wax together as a kit all i'm doing is getting some on here and wiping it on um i just i want a good even coverage i uh, want plenty on there i don't have to be extravagant with it but also don't don't want to be stingy with it and then i'm going to turn my lay speed down to about 200 somewhere in that neighborhood anyway and i'm going to use the same the section that I applied with, well, let's get it going forward so I don't confuse myself. I want to use that same section. And what I'm doing, this is like sanding. The abrasive paste will start um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 320, 240, 320, somewhere in there. And as the abrasive breaks down, it you end up with about a thousand grit sanding process. So all I'm doing now is allowing that abrasive to uh, work on that wood. Whatever the abrasive component is, um, as you continue to work it and you speed the lathe up here in a bit, it is breaking down, just getting finer and finer and finer. This could be diatomaceous earth, it could be pumice, it could be all sorts of things. I'm kind of listening and feeling that uh, abrasive is already starting to break down. I'm going to go ahead and speed up. It's going up to 400. Still using that same portion of my paper towel. Some people might like to use a uh, cloth, little little small cut up t-shirts or what have you. Um, I did. In fact, I've got a whole basket of cut up t-shirts over on the other side of the shop that I used to use an awful lot. But there's just so much risk of, you know, you have a little crack that develops and it can grab that cloth real easy. And if you're not careful, you have your fingers wrapped, or wrapped up in that cloth. I've never had an issue. Um, but I've seen people have issues. And so uh, 
I just don't take the chance. Use paper towel. Let the paper towel get torn away instead of your finger getting torn away. I thank you, Doug, for mentioning that because uh, I got into the paper towel only when a good friend of mine, an older feller, um, was doing that. He got a catch. Uh, the tenon damage was such that he can't turn any longer. Yeah, um, yeah. So band-aids don't fix that. So new, no, new. No. All right, I'm gonna speed up. There's 600. I'm just gonna flip over. There's my dirty section. I'm gonna go over to the clean section and continue. Still just letting the paste do its work. I am not, uh, I'm putting a little pressure on it, but it's not absorbent. Um, it's not like I'm trying to force anything into the wood. I'm just wanting the abrasive to do its job. And every time what's I... Your, what's your speed on doing that? I'm up to 600 now. Uh, Dane, one of the things I've discovered with this, I, I heard people say it, but then I've experimented with it as well. The speed as you turn it up doesn't matter. <laughs> just that you're increasing the speed uh, and then you change your the part of your paper towel that you're using. Um, it does two things. One, the speeding up and, and the more friction causes that, that uh, abrasive to break down further. Your clean paper towel section is... Uh, Helps, it's starting to remove the excess abrasive and also removes the beeswax, the mineral oil that's in here. I've said on is several of my videos that more acting isn't it more acting like a friction polish? Um, not exactly. Well, maybe, yeah, not exactly. Toward the end, maybe more so, but at the beginning, you you've got an awful lot of abrasive paste or abrasive in here. So you're actually sanding. None of the manufacturers that I've seen have said anything about this being a finish. Uh, uh, this is a part of the sanding process. Right. So what get another a wax. What's it being a wax base to fill in the wood grain? Wax. To some extent, um, there again, you got your beeswax that is the carrier for the abrasive. You got right. the mineral oil that is softening agent for the beeswax and we're going to end up uh, having most all of that gone before we're done. I'm going to continue this process until I get no residue on this paper towel. If I'm getting residue, there's still abrasive paste on, on this uh, piece of wood. But it's getting very smooth at this point. Yeah, if I'm going to use lacquer or something after I've used uh, the abrasive paste. I always strip it all back with denatured alcohol. Absolutely. Oh. All right. I'm still getting still getting residue. I'm up to twelve hundred at this point. And the other thing, I, I'm. Uh, um, I do add a little bit of pressure. Every time I speed it up, I add just a touch of pressure. And I think that's more psychological than anything. Seeing the shine come up and now. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, you, if I just did this, if I just sanded with regular sandpaper up to a thousand, I'd be getting a shine off of it like that too. This has darkened up a little bit because of the mineral oil and the beeswax that's in it. Of course, the sanding sealer darkened it a little bit. Well, one thing you did not see me do, you didn't did not see me denib after the sanding sealer. And that's because I put the abrasive paste on. Some people do. There's nothing wrong with denibbing it. Um, all right, we're starting to come off clean now. Nibbing? I'm sorry, what is that? Extremely light sanding. Uh, when, I, when I'm going to do something like that, I will typically use a 3M pad, these abrasive pads. That one's full of dust. It's been sitting around. I 
I've got a surplus of them. Um, but yeah, some people use 600 grit sandpaper. Some people would go to a thousand grit sandpaper just to take the little fuzz off that comes up anytime you raise the grain. The, yeah, the, alcohol the application, and, the application of sanding sealer raises the grain a bit. Yes, yes. That's what are, exactly where I was going, Matt. The alcohol does, but so does the sanding sealer. This is the Axe Restoring and Polishing Paste. It's white in the can because it's uh, everything is. His claim is that everything is laboratory grade. This is carnauba wax mixed with beeswax and mineral oil. Um, who am I to doubt the manufacturer, right? For those asking private messages, uh, somebody will put the link to Axe in the chat tonight uh, if you have yes. questions on it. And there are a couple other notes on here about how to make your own in your own shop. In fact, uh, mm. Tim Hatch got in trouble using his wife's crock pot to make some. Look right there on the top, guys. Oh, that thing is flashing. Look a at it. A little bit of chatoyans. <laughs> you can see the chatoyans all the way to Florida. Yeah, buddy. Okay, I'm going to slow back down. Just want to go back down to what? 400. Just work that wax in a little bit. And this wax is like almost all other waxes. You, you, uh, less is more. You don't need a whole lot. Spread it on there thin. Work it a bit until it gets just a little bit tacky. And once it does, what that tells you is that the the solvents that are in there, whatever they might be, have flashed off a bit. Supposedly, this wax has no chemical solvents. The solvent that is in here is beeswax, is what Tom says. So it's food safe. He claims it is. In fact, supposedly, there are several of the manufacturers, Eddie, who have taken their product, and put it on a piece of toast and eaten it. Um, that's what they okay. want to do, fine. <laughs> I can't I'll have butter my... anymore. I can no longer have butter, but I'm not going that way. Yeah, I think I'd rather have strawberry jam than, than uh, carnauba wax. Um, I've got this running at 1400 right now. Just buffing it, not a lot of pressure, not building a lot of heat. I don't want to melt it. I don't want to rub it off. I, I want the wax to stay. I just want to help it cure. And this will cure. If I leave this sit and come back this time tomorrow and put another coat on it, it will be night and day. But I'm, then I'm putting wax on top of wax and not mixing two layers of wax. Um, there's, I don't remember who said it now, Matt or Billy One, if I was going to do lacquer, um, after the abrasive paste before the wax, I would, uh, you know, get it wiped down good. Then I'd come back with a coat of, uh, or with a paper towel full of denatured alcohol. I clean that off real good. And then the lacquer would stick to it without any problem. Okay, we got one more little process here. They come to a stop. Well, before I stop it, bing, bing. Love that flash. Okay. I'm going to turn it right around. I'm going to open these jaws up inside of that. Heard the question yesterday. How far, how tight do you tighten up that chuck when you're expanding into the piece itself? And the standard answer is, of course, till just before it cracks the first time. 
<laughs> That's my answer too. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be nice if we could know? That would be a super if we could know. All right, did it again. Got to unlock it before you turn it on. There we go. Now, we've got the tenon on here. We want to make this a round bottom. Light cuts. Just a little bit right here in the center. Used to be amazed at how people would say, oh, I've got just a little hump here. They were look, seeing it. I could not see it. I couldn't feel it, but they were seeing it. Well, I've come to a place now where I'm seeing more than I ever did when I was younger. But my vision is not any better, I can promise you. Well, that won't work. Well, nowadays, you know what you're looking for. Well, that's part of it, Eddie. You, you, yeah, you learn how, how to look. I think part of it too is learning how to place your lights in your shop. I've got fluorescent, incandescent, and, and LED right overhead. All of those are on now. My fingers right. always feel more than my eyes ever see. Exactly, Billy. That's the other part of it. You can feel it um, long before you can see it. An old trick I learned a long time ago was Take a common pencil, lay it on a piece, especially the outsides, lay it on a piece and flex it along, the, just roll it around and with, with your fingers on the pencil and you will feel every depression and every bump magnified with that. See, right, when you do that, right there. Just like that. You will feel every bump, every divot. If it doesn't go sure smooth, will. it's not smooth. I've slowed the lathe back down to 435 at this point. Uh, this is 100 grit. 60 degree or 60 grit went flying somewhere. I don't. Oh, I see it now. I think that might be the 320. One of the nice things about slowing down. Not only does it, is it more efficient to sand at a slower speed, but as you can see, most of the dust, especially these heavier grids, most of your dust goes straight down. I'm seeing a little bit that's floating over and coming back toward the chuck even, but most of it is going straight down. Well, that's what my very effective dust avoidance fan is for. Yeah, you have one overhead, don't you? Yeah, a little bit of six inch fan blows straight now. Right. That was 100. This is 150. And I'm just, just touching this edge between the raw wood and the, and the waxed wood. Partly because if I get too much into that wax wood, it's going to gum up my sandpaper. It'll blow out, but we're good there. 240.
Members, this is Doug Miller doing a demonstration on a round-bottomed bowl. If you're just joining us, we've been at this since it was a block of wood, and we're taking it all the way through a finish with, uh, Doug is using Axe um, products for, the, for the, uh, the, to finish it with. Um, we, we have a couple of notes on what we over driving at, uh, that Axe product, no, there are about a dozen products out there you make your choice which one you like to use. Uh, we happen to be using that, the, the product by Axe right now. Doesn't mean you can't be happy with the other one. Why not? There are, there are loads of them out there, and, and uh, they're all so very similar. I started off using uh, Shop Made, and I use that. I had one jar, I think it was a eight or nine ounce nine ounce jar that I used for over a year it's closer to a year and a half that I used that jar and uh, finally ran out of it I wanted to try this axe um, so that's what I did I, I, I've gone to axe and um, I'm, I'm just finishing up my first jars of it and I've got a I want a sample kit so uh, I'll use my sample kit before I move on that sanding sealer. Lacquer sanding sealer. And that's just because I like it. That's all. No real rhyme or reason. And the product is using from Deft, D-E-F-T. It can be yes. purchased on Amazon or Ace Hardware Store, so through PP. PPG Paint Company. Um, I was looking for some of the uh, aerosol, and I got the Deft, and I found one company that had, it seemed like a ridiculously cheap price. Lo and behold, it's the company that makes Deft. So I got, I got two cans from them for what Amazon was going to sell me, one can, but then I had to pay the shipping on top of that. So, uh, you know, don't, don't think you have to go with Amazon either. You're gonna share that with us, right? <laughs> Matt, I would, but I, I'd i have to go look it up. Yeah, I know, when you get a chance, because um, some of us were having trouble finding the deaf lacquer online, the lacquer sanding sealer. Oh yeah, sealer. right. I can't even find it locally, let alone online. Right. If I'm lucky, my local Ace if Hardware lucky, Management. Uh, uh, okay, Matt, Dan. Jerry, that place that you told me, I've been talking to them, and they've been checking the their supplier. And right now, in theory, it's supposed to be in the end of the month tomorrow. In theory, but they've already passed one of those. But I'd let everybody know if they actually come up with it. That's what we're here for, folks. Sharing information. Do, do, do. Yeah, PPG Agricultural Finishes in Pittsburgh, PA. Well, it's manufactured for them. Um, I think I got it from the actual manufacturer. I'll have to I'll look that up, Matt, and, and put it in the chat if I can find it before we get done tonight. Much appreciated. If not, next week will be fine. Yeah, yeah. Or I guess I could, if I was a really good guy, I could send it to Dave and have him put it on the website, couldn't I? That would work. Dave's going to find out anyway. You can't keep the secret from Dave. No, that's true. Okay, I'm up to a thousand on this on this bottom. And it's starting to get extremely smooth. That's what you're after. You 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 want to continue buffing and, and until it just gets really smooth. It's almost a shame to put wax on it, but we're gonna. I want it to look like the other two pieces. I say the other two pieces. The other two pieces of black limba that I've already done, and I'll show those to you here in just a few minutes back down to 200. I'm 
Shoo. I can't imagine having to go back to a belt change lathe now that I've had this for a couple of years. I love turning that knob and changing my speed. I do too. It's real easy to get spoiled for that. Oh my. Mm -hmm. I agree with took that, me about, yes. Uh, took me about two sessions in the on the shop or in the shop with this new system to get spoiled by it. But when I got it, when I ordered it, Jeff and Jeff Horning and I talked about it for a long time and he said, you, you'll never go back. He's right. I'm looking at my Nova Mercury over there across on the other side and it's a, uh, it's variable speed, but I can't believe that I, I went all that time with this bell change. Uh, but I did. And I enjoyed it, but I turned an awful lot at one speed. And I never got over a thousand. Now I routinely go fourteen to sixteen hundred RPMs. It's like that's this is twelve hundred now. Yeah, I even converted my old Delta ten inch MIDI to variable speed as soon as I got the chance. Yeah. Again, I will put more wax on this baby tomorrow. There's the bowl that I did. There's the box that I showed you last week or week before. Absolutely gorgeous. Need to do. Here we go. Oh, that's yeah, nice, Doug. Nice little round I, bottom bowl. Great demo, buddy. Thank you for a wonderful demo. That's nice, Doug. Very, very nice. Look at this. Look at this <laughs> thing. Thing is gorgeous. I love how those spin around. Yeah, yeah this toy has off. its. It's a great job. <laughs> we we <laughs> wobble, but they don't fall down. That's right. That's right. Now, I'll uh, uh, full disclosure. I leave a little bit of weight in the bottom of that round bottom um, because I do want it to wobble. But I really do not want it to turn over. Um, I don't think it would, but uh, it's it's not absorbent. It's, it's uh, well, I can tell you. I've got calipers here somewhere. Here they are. Hard to find amongst all the stuff sometimes. Y'all don't have that problem, I know. I'm the only one. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm pushing half inch on the bottom of this bowl. Yeah. But it's uh, more like an eighth on the walls. Great. Nice, yeah. Smooth, round bottom. Any other okay. questions y'all have? Yeah. On chat right now, we have a listing for a depth sanding sealer uh, at woodworkingshop.com. That information is on your chat. Nice job, Doug. Nice job, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, Thank really you. Great job, man. Thanks. Thank you very much. Nice demo, Doug. 